Dr. Melanie Conrad, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, you're joining me from Berlin. Uh, you work at uh, Charité Medical University. You yes. specialize in reproductive immunology. Yes, and I you am. have a whole team there, right? You have their own like Conrad lab. I do. It's so exciting. I finally have people <laughs> to help me do this work. It's really good. How long have you been doing it? Um, I got my PhD in Canada in 2006. And then I, I thought, oh, yes, I'd like to I'd like to live in Europe for one or two years, do a postdoc before I go back to Canada. And so I came and I actually moved to a small town called Marburg in Germany. And I did a postdoc there actually for four years. And then I ended up moving to Berlin. And so I've been in Berlin for 11 years now. So, yeah, I think I'm, I'm pretty much set here. <laughs> so. you, it's funny because you have a bit of a German accent now. Everyone, this is so bizarre. I don't, every time I go home to Canada, people say, oh, you have such a German accent. But I don't think my accent sounds like this. So, and then I, when I say that, they say, oh, right, right. It's not, it doesn't sound like that. Then you say, oh, you have a European accent. So I can't identify what it is because I can't really. Tell you know, I, I can I can hear it because I actually, uh, you know, have been in relationships with uh, or in a relationship with a German uh, person before. And I can hear it. You know what it is? It's the um, extra pronunci pronunciation of consonants like the N or the T. It's like that little extra whoop. It's really interesting. I find it fascinating. Okay, cool. I'm going to listen to that like next time that I'm talking somewhere and try to figure yeah, it exactly. out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so I guess let's let's just ju let's just jump into it because I'm really curious to know. Uh, I happened upon your Twitter profile. That's how I found out about you, and I started reading about the research that you were doing because when I'm looking for guests, I'm looking for people that pique my curiosity because it makes the interview more interesting but nice. also I uh I find I found what you do really fascinating and really apropos with today's work in microbiome research and the fact that when it comes to things like asthma for example which is something that you research a lot um there's a lot we don't know yeah this is actually it's this is why I think research is so interesting so our projects, we have tons of different projects, and all of them are based on trying to figure out, you know, what makes someone susceptible to have asthma. But when you think about it, when you ask the question, okay, how does asthma occur at all? Like, why do you get allergic at a certain point in your life? <laughs> Quite literally, we don't know. <laughs> so there's a lot of, you know, it's not to say that, you know, oh, science doesn't know anything, but there's a lot of ideas, there's a lot of theories, and I think also because asthma is um, a multifactorial disease. So it means that there's there's a whole bunch of different things, that different small things that can happen. For instance, maybe um, your cells in your lungs, they provide a barrier to the environment, and maybe they don't provide that barrier very well. And so that's one, one thing that can happen. Or you can have nerves that are really, really overreactive if they get stimulated with something. And so that can also contribute to it. And then there's you know, so it's it's all of these different things that make it even more complex because they can all combine together to make kind of the phenotype of the disease. So I have to ask you, one of the things I found with scientists is that they either go into research because of personal uh, experience with whatever it is that they're researching or just out of um, ac by accident. Um, so in your case, how did you become an asthma or let's say a, somebody who studies asthma? So I actually... I think I'm a bit of an odd case because ever since I was a little kid, I knew I was going to be some kind of scientist. I was the kid like, you know, everyone else is playing with dolls or trucks and I'm like dissecting berries outside and doing <laughs> weird stuff. So um, and then I, so I knew I was going to do science. And then when I was in high school, of course, I really fell in love with biology. So I said, OK, I'm going to be a biologist, but that's also extremely broad. And then when I was doing my bachelor's, I took a third year immunology class and it basically just blew my mind how freaking cool it is that there's hundreds and hundreds of cells that are running around our body protecting us from everything that, and you know, keeping us alive and keeping us healthy and stuff. And so that was how I decided. And then when I was going to do my PhD, I actually, I went into immunogenetics. So basically studying the genes that code for the cell or the proteins in the cells, et cetera. And 
yeah, I, I kind of liked the immune side a little bit more. And so then my first postdoc that I mentioned in Marburg, uh, that was with a person, you know, researching asthma. And so that's kind of, I was like, hey, this sounds great. <laughs> I'm going to go over there, learn all about this. And yeah, then I just kept going from there because it was so cool. Okay. So yeah, that that's what I was curious about. I was like, either she had children who had asthma <laughs> or she happened to, you know, to come across it based on, you know, just work experience. And it sounds like you really just kind of followed the path, you know, just, Absolutely. you just kind of saw what was curious. You said the word that was um, very pertinent, which I find really interesting is multifactorial, which is something that I think a lot of people, uh, you know, who are patients don't realize, you know, what that means. It, it essentially means that, you know, it, there can be several causes, there can be one cause, there can be several things that, that trigger um, an event in the body. And it, um, it must be frustrating for specifically for patients, because it touches different specialties when it comes to medicine, right? Uh, so in your case, um, you really looked at environmental causes for a while too, right? So what did you find there? So this is where my, my kind of I guess the impetus for my entire lab came about because, you know, when I was doing my postdoc, um, we were trying to understand, um, there's several <clears throat> like um, human studies, epidemiological studies that have shown that if children grow up in a farming environment. So in, in Germany, they have, um, there are some very, very traditional type farms where they have really close contact with the animals, with the hay, they drink raw milk that has unpasteurized, et cetera, et cetera. And there are several studies that have been done kind of in these farming communities. And they show that if, um, number one, if children grow up in these farming communities, they have much less um, risk for developing asthma. And then the major interesting thing that they found was that they also found an association between if a woman is pregnant and lives in this traditional farming environment, there's also a prenatal protective effect on their children to stop them from getting asthma. And I was just utterly fascinated by this because this is a transgenerational thing. So what you do when you're pregnant or the environment that you're in can actually affect you know, the disease susceptibility of your children. So that's something that's a really complex, interesting puzzle that I really wanted to try to, to figure out. So that's kind of how I got started with it. How many generations uh, did you study? Did you study just the, the, the mother and the baby in the womb kind of a thing? Or did you go back a few generations with like the grandmother also lived in the country? So um, we actually... So they have done studies to show that there are multi-generational effects. So for instance, there's um, something really interesting called, and I have to be careful about this, I don't know exactly everything, but it's called the Dutch hunger winter. And so this was a time during the war when there was um, very, very little food and they had to go on rations. And so they had, there's a study that looked at, okay, there's pregnant women who had full amount of food they needed, everything was fine. And then there were pregnant women who had to go on rations. And they could show that those women that had rationed food during pregnancy and not enough nutrition, their children actually had a higher susceptibility for, um, I want to say cardiovascular disease, but I, I'm not entirely sure. So we'll just leave it at that. Okay. But um, they could also show that their children's children also had, you know, some kind of an, of an effect from that. And so that's actually, we would like to do that, but um, we actually use mouse models to study this. And um, we want to do multi-generational mouse models, but we're still trying to figure out kind of the mom <laughs> and the baby. So, <laughs> Right. And I think that's called, uh, that, that's a subsection of uh, genetic research called epigenetics, right? I mean, how how that transfers over generations over time. Mm -hmm. So then in your case, okay, so growing up in, I guess, on farmland seems to be beneficial. Would that yes. be the correct word? Yeah. Okay. And what is it specifically? Is it the lack of pollution? So this is the other thing we can come back to the kind of multifactorial thing, right? Again, so um, there's a number of different things but one of the things that we think is um, a major influence is the exposure to bacteria and uh, so of course as you know there's bacteria all, all around us everywhere there's pathogenic bacteria that's not good there's beneficial bacteria for instance in our gut that make us you know trains our immune system helps us to digest our food etc and so what we 
I, I hypothesized was the children who are growing up in the farming environments, they're exposed to way more bacteria than say, if you imagine, you know, um, a house where someone cleans all the time and sterilizes everything and there's no bacteria and there's no contact. So our hypothesis was maybe it has something to do with either the types of bacteria that are on the farm or the amount of bacteria. Because, you know, even if you think about it, you know, if you compare my house right now to a farmhouse that is right beside cows and hay and everything, there's going to be way more bacteria um, in that area just because there's way more contact with the land. And so what we did um, in my, my first postdoc when I was in Marburg, what we wanted to do is to design something called a proof of concept model. So the human studies, they, they say, okay, we see an association with being pregnant on a farming environment and protection against asthma in the children. But this is, this is kind of, um, it's a correlation. So we can't say this, this is definitely a cause, it's just an observation. And so what we need is we need a method to check, hey, you know, if we have an experimental way to test, we think these bacteria are doing something positive. How can we test that? We obviously can't take some pregnant women and just give them some random bacteria. <laughs> That's a super bad idea. So we have, um, we actually made a mouse model and it was really, really cool because um, we basically made it the mice. And then during pregnancy, we gave the mother this specific type of, type of bacteria called Atsinitobacter luofi. It's a super long name. We just can call it A. luofi. We gave them this bacteria through the entirety of their pregnancy. So we had a group that had the bacteria during their pregnancy, and then we had a group that had just, you know, just salt water during their pregnancy. Just they, So it was the control group. And what we could show is the babies from the moms that had treatment with bacteria had much less severe asthma than the babies from control mothers. And this was, this was so cool. I, I don't know. I lost my mind. And so that's exactly why I'm doing all of this work. <laughs> wow. What a discovery though. Uh, I mean, you must've been elated. I, I can see it on your face here. You're smiling widely just at the thought of knowing that. Um, so now what happens next? I mean, now you've kind of identified a bacteria. Um, what happens next? Yeah, so this is basically, this study was what I built my whole entire lab on. And so the next stuff we tried to do was, okay, well, yes, we have a nice model. Of course, now we want to say, you know, what is the mechanism? So what are the things contributing during the pregnancy that are influencing the baby? And so we thought it could have a couple of things. So what we thought is when we give the mother this, this bacteria, she has an immune response against it. It's not a bad immune response. It's basically if you have any foreign bacteria in your body, your immune system kicks in and goes, oh, gee, this bacteria shouldn't be here. Let's get rid of it. And I also have to emphasize the bacteria that we gave her were dead bacteria. So they couldn't even cause an infection. But the immune system, of course, kicks in and says, all right, this bacteria shouldn't be here. Let's get rid of it. And so we thought maybe if the mother has these immune compounds that are circulating in her bloodstream, those can actually travel through the placenta to the developing fetus. And the thing is the immune system develops during fetal life and also during neonatal life. And also the lungs are developing. So if we have some, some compounds from the immune system from the mom that aren't usually there, maybe they're somehow you know, encouraging the immune system of the fetus to say, hey, you can be a little bit more tolerant or you can be a little bit more relaxed you know, when you're born or something like that. So you're researching very specifically the fetus. You're not researching the child afterwards, if the child were to consume that bacteria kind of thing. So we're actually, we're specifically researching pregnancy just because the question is so big. And so basically what, what I wanted to, to do is kind of start chronologically. So, okay, what happens when we give the mom the bacteria? And then, well, oh, we see these things in the circulation. What happens to the fetus? And then, ah, what happens when... Um, the, the offspring is born and is breastfeeding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we study until the, the offspring has asthma and what kind of that effect. Is. And we're, we're slowly starting to expand now. We're expanding our models. And also a super cool thing, we're studying the postnatal time period now. So basically when the, the offspring is breastfeeding and we're actually able to study breast milk from mice now. It's so cool. <laughs> I had no idea that was even a possibility. <laughs> I also didn't, but there was this amazing woman in our lab who she made a, a, 
a little, like you can use a human breast milk pump and then there's this, um, it's like a design manufacturing kind of place at our hospital and you can go to them with a research design and say, hi, I need a receptacle to be able to like put on a mouse teat and get breast milk out of it and collect it. And they built us one <laughs> and now we can actually Amazing. collect breast milk. It's really cool. <laughs> That that is very very. You're gonna have to post pictures of that sometime, I think, <laughs> just so I can see that. <laughs> um. So okay. So you've done this amazing research with mice. Uh. Pretty much. You know. Really isolating that. You know. Perhaps it is this bacteria. Um. It seems to be working. Blah blah blah. How then? I, what baffles my mind is how we go from mouse studies to humans, because it seems like such a huge leap. And like you said, like, can you give a dead bacteria to a pregnant woman? I mean, is that even ethical? I don't know. Yeah. So this is this is actually a really big question, and I am I'm trying to kind of talk about this a little bit more because if I'm very honest, I do not want. To do mouse research. If I had another system that I could test, I would use that for sure. But right now, the only thing I can do is be as ethical as I can and, you know, give my mice as nice kind of a, a life as they can when I'm treating them. And um, yes, the mouse system and the human system are physiologically really, really different. However, we can still learn lots of stuff about how mechanism works. So there's actually there's lots of studies that they try things in a mouse and they say, oh, listen, we think that this drug will be really effective. And then they jump over and they try it in humans and it doesn't work. So this happens in some cases, and this is because of the differences in physiology. But if you think about just understanding how the immune system works in general, this is really, I guess if I want to classify myself, you could say you're either like a basic research researcher who wants to find out how does this work and what do what pathways happen to to make this final result or you say i want to be able to go give pregnant women some kind of drug so their clinical asthma will be improved in their children or something so i would i would classify myself more as a basic researcher and so mouse work is actually really really important for being able to learn this stuff and if we even want to think about it I keep remembering my mom. She I was talking to her on the phone one day and she said she was a little bit upset. And she said, I, I just heard that someone got a lot of money to do research on fruit flies. And she was baffled because she said, why? You got a million euro to research flies that are in my kitchen. And this is a this is a perfectly valid point. You're like, why would you research flies? It's so far away from humans. But if you think about the research that has come out. So these flies are called Drosophila. If you think about what they have learned from there and th that basically directly applies to the human immune system, it's absolutely baffling. So it's it's really, it's cool. And cross-species stuff is great for identifying mechanism for sure. So that that's, okay, so you've totally perfectly explained that. So essentially, guys, like the mouse research, yes, it might not transfer exactly to humans, but we're learning about the the human immune system. And I guess it makes sense. I mean, our DNA, it, I mean, it's so close to all other creatures on, on, on this planet. Uh, there's a lot that we have in common with these creatures. And and I, I suppose it, it absolutely does make sense. Um, um, so so how I, what I'm curious about now is how did you get to that one bacteria? Like, how did you narrow it down to that one bacteria? Okay, that is actually a really great question. So we had um, colleagues who had conducted this, this, human, this human study. And then what they did is they thought, okay, we want to find out what kind of bacteria are on these farming sites. So they actually had, you know, someone's PhD project was go to all of these traditional farms with a vacuum and vacuum in their house and collect all the dust and then take the bacteria like out of there and analyze what kind of bacteria is here. So they did this really amazing analysis for us, and um, they found that this this Aedes bacteria was present in really high concentrations, kind of on farming sites in general. But the thing is, so we picked that single bacteria to treat our mice because when you're doing experimental research, you have to be really, really to the point. So here's one bacteria that could cause something. If we took a whole bunch of bacteria, we wouldn't know what was doing what and stuff. So we picked this one bacteria, but I don't think it's that 
I don't think it's because Ala Wufi is a magical bacteria or something special. Um, Because we have tried it also with other bacteria, and it also works with other bacteria, but to differing degrees. And so I think it's just the fact that in a farm, you have tons of bacteria that you're exposed to all of the time. And if it's if it's bacteria that's not dangerous, this is actually really good for you. Did you guys also sample urban apartments, for example, for that bacteria? So we haven't done that, but there are studies that have looked in urban environments. And so in urban environments, there's also, like you mentioned previously, there's pollution. So diesel exhaust is a really big uh, trigger. Also during pregnancy, it's not great to be exposed to lots of diesel when you're developing a human. Um, but we haven't actually uh, had any like look in non-traditional kind of housing situations ourselves. Okay, yeah, I was curious because, uh, you know, just to see if, if maybe that bacteria is also occurring in urban environments. But I, I think I think what you're also saying is the thing that we all know as non-scientists is that, you know, what's healthier? Being outside in nature than in an apartment where, like, right now I can smell my neighbor's cigarette smoke. I can smell it right now as I'm talking to you, you know, and, and it's built in the 70s. And who knows what kind of mold is in, is in these walls, you know. So my girlfriend and I are actually moving to PEI. Uh, we're going to build cool. out in nature, in woodland, next to a creek. And, you know, I think it, it, we're both in our 40s and we're both like, we're tired of this city life. She grew up on a farm. I grew up in the forest. We're used to to nature. But I think um, it's, it's weird, isn't it, that uh, we all know the answer is get closer to nature. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. we really do. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I think sometimes we just uh, get a little busy and then forget. I think the thing is I we guess. all know what we have to do. Like lots of I, I did an interview a little while ago and someone said, what do you recommend to pregnant women to keep their children safe? And then I was like, yeah, um, try not to have stress and sleep and eat really well. And yeah, go outside. Yeah, it's, we all know this stuff. It's just hard to, hard to make it happen for whatever reason. Oh, totally, totally. Um, I'm also, uh, you looked at antibiotics, didn't you? antibiotics yes. during pregnancy. So what did you find with that? So this is actually another model that I'm really excited about. And this is our most recent one. Um, the reason why I think it's so cool is because, so the first model we developed was a protection model. So if these bacteria, if the women are around them when they're pregnant, their children are protected against asthma. And then what we did with our antibiotic model is we did a very similar thing, but we said, hey, um, Killing bacteria is probably a really bad idea. And um, if you take antibiotics during pregnancy, you're, you're killing the bacteria in your microbiome. So um, what we did was we did the exact same thing. We took the mice and we gave them antibiotics in the last um, 10 days of pregnancy. Um, we tested, um, sorry, mouse pregnancy is 21 days. So we gave them from the last two trimesters, basically. And we gave them in the same concentrations that people would receive them in either low, medium, or high doses. And what we showed was finally actually what we wanted to show. Science is sometimes a really bad mistress and doesn't, <laughs> doesn't give you the results you want. But this was an experiment that actually worked really well. So when the mothers have antibiotics during pregnancy, and then we induce asthma in their offspring, the, the offspring from the moms with the antibiotics have much, much more severe asthma. And so it's a risk model. And so now we have a model where we can protect the babies, we have a model that we can like induce higher risk in the babies. And then what we're trying to do is investigate all of the things that are happening in the mom and in the fetus during development in both models. And we hope some of those things will be opposite. And then we can say, this is a really strong case that this is one of the mechanisms that's happening because in the opposite models are doing opposite things. Man, do you remember the days when they used to give us antibiotics just nilly willy? <laughs> yeah, they're like, here, antibiotics this, uh, for you, antibiotics for you. Uh, it was like, oh, you have a cold. Take this antibiotic. And now we're at the, this this amazing, um, you know, section or, or point in science uh, research where we know that oh my god, actually those bacteria are, that are in the microbiome for the most part are good for you like don't don't go and kill them all every time there's an infection uh, so so what you've done is is really really interesting because you're 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 really deep diving into the microbiome and so 
let's talk about the microbiome for a second here, because I'm really, I think this is like the next thing in science. It's, it's really a big field of research in immunology as well, but in it, everything, inflammation, uh, disease, uh, you know, weight, uh, weight gain, weight loss, uh, things like that. Um, so what fascinates you the most about the microbiome? What would you like to study next about it? So I think with our antibiotic model, um, I actually, this was, so I basically would say I'm a specialist in pregnancy, plat placentation, and immunology. And then for the antibiotic model, of course, we jumped into microbiome analysis. We didn't do very much microbiome analysis with the, the protection um, a Lewifi model. But yes, yeah, so I jumped in and then I went, oh, wow, I don't know anything. <laughs> so in the past, in the past three years, I've, I've been like massively trying to learn all of this stuff. That's one thing that's really cool because when you're a researcher, you always get the, you can choose to say, okay, I feel like I never know anything, or you can say, I'm always learning. So you can, it's good to say, I'm always learning, then you feel better. But um, for, the, for the microbiome, what I find so fascinating is how much stuff it does and how massively important it is, especially for development, actually, in the case of my research. The, so basically, when the, a baby is born, um, so the, the, the womb is sterile. There's no bacteria in there. There's no nothing. There's currently kind of a discussion right now um, if the fetus or if the amniotic fluid in a, a pregnant woman, if there's bacteria in there. But I, I, from my opinion, I really, really don't think there is. I think there's bacterial components, but there's no live bacteria. So if we take that thought, when a baby is born, the very first contact that it gets to basically seed um, its, its intestine with bacteria is from the mother's vaginal microbiome and the mother's perineal mac microbiome and also fecal microbiome. And so at birth, the baby gets exactly what the mom has. So this is why if she takes antibiotics and her, her microbiome is depleted, the baby is going to start out with a depleted microbiome. And then your immune system, when it's developing as a baby, your immune system has to interact with the bacteria in your gut in order to develop properly. And this blows my mind. This is, I, I, ugh, I can't even, I don't yeah, even have any I, words. I, I'm mind blown as well, trust me. <laughs> and the, the, the cool thing about this is you, there, are, there are mice, and they're called germ-free mice. And these are basically mice that they, they deliver them by a cesarean section, and they keep them under very, very sterile conditions. And so they don't have any microbiome. They don't have any bacteria in their intestine. And what happens with these mice is they can definitely show if there are no bacteria in your intestine, there are weird problems with the immune system and it doesn't develop properly. So that's, yeah, it's really, really interesting. So that's why this is also really cool for our models and how the immune system develops, because if it develops, in a tolerant way, it's going to protect against asthma and it develops in a dysfunctional way, then you're going to freak out if you see a piece of pollen. So, oh, Wow. I mean, just just wow, because I, I, I mean, what is there to say to that? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I had no idea. I thought the baby was born with a micro, like, I, I, I mean, I guess they are born with a microbiome. They just don't have it in the womb, like you said. That's my understanding yeah, exactly. of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... So I guess the the emphasis is really on the the woman to to have like a healthy microbiome to to really pass on the best to her to her child really in, in the end. I mean Yeah, it's actually it's actually pre and postnatal. So of course when you're pregnant, yes, you want to uh, every woman when they're pregnant tries to do a, the absolute best that they can for their baby and this is the difficult thing as well because 25% of women have to take antibiotics during pregnancy. And I don't Why? think this is, I, I don't think, so you mentioned how they used to just prescribe antibiotics like crazy. So that's maybe a little part of it. The doctor is paranoid. They don't want anything to happen to the baby. Take this antibiotics. But I think a lot of times pregnancy does really weird stuff to your body. And you also get like women get bladder infections and things that are just they have to be treated or else because an infection is also incredibly dangerous during pregnancy. And so I think it's just because of the weird things happening to your body, um, you need to take antibiotics because all of this stuff is happening. And so that's, you know, if there's so many women taking antibiotics and messing with, you know, with their microbiome and they 
kind of don't really have a choice. We really want to try to figure out a way we can help them with that. But the, it's not only prenatally because the, so the baby's born with the maternal microbiome initially. But if you look at a baby, it, what do they do? They, they have their hand in their mouth the whole time. If you look at a toddler, they're like eating dirt and touching everything, putting everything in their mouth. So the, the microbiome also gets influenced basically throughout neonatal development from the infants running around and touching things. And that's a normal kind of development process. So it's, it's kind of pre and postnatal. Interesting. With regards to antibiotics, though, would you would you say that science perhaps needs to advance antibiotics themselves to only target bad bacteria? Or is that something that science will never be able to do? I think this is actually really, really hard because because how we kill bacteria now is for, from very, very broad um, attacks, so to say. So they say, OK, listen, there's bacteria that have a certain type of membrane. And these antibiotics pop that membrane and the bacteria dies. And there's there's like hundreds of thousands of good and bad bacteria in there. So we can't really distinguish. And so all of the methods that antibiotics use to kill, they just kind of kill indiscriminately for, I, it, there's broad spectrum antibiotics that kill basically everything. And then there's antibiotics that are like, okay, I'm more specific for these types of bacteria, but they can't distinguish between good and bad because they're they're so similar in structure, so. So do you, do you think that that's something that could be possible? Like could, I don't know, a new antibiotic be developed? Or, or do you think that, uh, you know, it's really, that's the reason why infections are so sneaky is because they kind of mimic good bacteria? That, so that's not something I can talk about very much, but there's a really interesting researcher named Bonnie Bassler. And she, I saw a TED talk from her a, a really long time ago, but she studies something called quorum sensing. So this is basically like how bacteria communicate with each other. So a bacteria um, can say, so basically from her talk, if you get a couple bacteria inside your body you're, and they just start releasing some toxins, it's not going to do anything because you are a giant compared to a bacteria. So what the bacteria have to be able to do is say, you know, it gets into your stomach, it's a pathogen or it gets into your intestine as a pathogen. It has to you know, keep on multiplying until there's a big population of bacteria that when they secrete all their toxins, then you'll get sick. And they have to have a way to communicate that. And so they, what they do is they secrete these little tiny molecules that are very, very species specific that basically say, okay, you know, we have enough um, people here or bacteria here that we can release our toxin. And so what, what Bonnie Bassler is doing is she makes kind of antagonists of these molecules. So she's so she also does mouse work. And so what she has done is given an infection to a mouse. And then the bacteria, of course, grow. They release all these little, these little molecules to kind of say, hey, we're here or whatever. And then she gives molecules that counteract those. So all the bacteria in the population don't know that they're at a good enough concentration to release their toxins. And then they don't. And then that gives time to like for the other antibiotics to treat or something like that. So there's, there's people like doing really cool stuff. The other problem is. There's been no really major advances in antibiotics for probably about 35 years because we developed them and we went, yay, wonderful. We kicked their butts and then we didn't do anything anymore. And now everything's becoming resistant. And so it's like, hey, everyone, research antibiotic resistance, please. It's important. There's so, uh, you know, I recently wrote an Instagram post because I, I developed deep pressure or sorry, not deep pressure, but just uh, delayed pressure hives. So I've had that since like April, uh, unknown idiopathic because like 80% of hives are idiopathic because we, there's so much we don't know about yeah. these things, you know, and I think uh, I, I totally lost my train of thought there. But essentially, you know, we go back to what you said earlier, which is multifactorial, which is that we just don't know where things come from. There's oh, yeah. So there's not enough science being done. There's just just not enough. I mean, um, in the post that I wrote, I, I, I learned yesterday from a mite scientist that they haven't surveyed all the mites. Like, most of the mites that are discovered today are new species because there are so many mites. So <laughs> I'm like, I'm always, um, you know, when you deep dive into science, when you know more about science, when you start to really research science, you start to see that, oh, we actually don't know as much 
as as I thought we did. Does that make any so, sense? This is actually I I love that you made this statement because the thing is we know actually a huge amount of information. But the nature of answering a question is it generates five more questions. So kind of the more knowledge you get, the, it's like exponentially more knowledge that you have to learn after that. So sometimes, so it's kind of, it's exciting, but at the same time, you know, you publish your paper and say, oh, but I didn't answer any of these 10 questions yet. Oh man. And then you, so that's why yeah, I'm going to be researching till I'm a hundred or something. I don't know. Um, so I have to ask you now that we've, we've, we're talking about research, at what point does medical research uh, cross the barrier into practicing medicine. So, you know, there are a lot of, for example, I'll give you, I'll give you the best example I can think of. 20 years ago, I had IBS really, really bad. I lost 60 pounds in two months. I had a family doctor who would just threw her hands up in the air and said, look, I read a study, an obscure study the other day that said that they were able to treat IBS with cholesteramine, uh, Questran. Okay, great. She's like, you know what? Do you want to try it? And I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> do it. Literally overnight, my the IBS was gone, and I was I was wow. great. I was on on cholesteramine for two years, and I was cured, and I never had issues ever again. So this this you know physician happened to look at one obscure piece of research. Um, that's not the general case in mm -hmm. in practicing medicine, where where usually you work with generalities. What's the most common cause or you don't look for zebras you look for horses because it sounds like a horse um so but at, from your from your experience as a researcher um you might know this more than i do which is at what point does it cross into you know actual medicine um so from my side so coming from the side of a basic researcher um i'm probably not very good at answering that question so i think there are, so in my hospital anyway, and in Germany, if you are a medical doctor, you you generally, in order to advance, from my understanding anyway, you have to also do research and publish. Um, so in that case, this is where this weird juxtaposition comes, because if you're like a trained physician and you're doing research, it's going to be a different kind of research than if you're a trained researcher doing research. I kind of feel like it would be like them saying, hey, Melanie, can you go treat those patients? I'd be like, what? <laughs> I right. only had like, or they give me like some training. So I think when we're talking about research and medicine, I think, yes, normally they say, yes, you need to have this double blind, blah, this, 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 you know, study, et cetera, et cetera, which costs all this money. But, you know, I think if it is a case where your, your, your doctor or your medical professional is really into kind of reading research and they say, listen, I know that this will have no bad effects on your body, but we can try it. Then that's, that's cool. Like, cause sometimes if something, if you don't have a solution, you just, you try everything you can. Right. And this is also where it's yeah. kind of dangerous because I like a lot, I think a lot of people are sometimes frustrated with Western medicine and then they go, they kind of get trapped into unresearched, like really bogus kind of stuff as well, which is why, yeah, sometimes it's a little bit difficult. And especially because, you know, science journal articles are, are behind a paywall. So all the information that you get is the free stuff, which is all the woo-woo stuff, which is, you know, the, the, the kind of easily accessible stuff that you, you, you can't, you know, you, it's just not comparable to real science. Actually, something that's really cool, though, that they've started, um, well, they had it for a little while, but it's getting more and more popular. And I'm also trying to encourage any researcher who is out there, please, if you publish, you can pay a fee to publish open access. And it's different price for every journal or whatever, but usually your supervisor writes that into their grant application. My hospital actually has an agreement with several journals that if I want to make any of my articles open access in those journals, my hospital pays for it. So please check into your university, check into your hospital if they have journal agreements and try everything you can to publish open access because every single person should be able to access your article because that's what the purpose of science is. So brilliant. I'm actually going to make that a sound clip because that needs to be heard on science Twitter. I think that's going to be reshared. 
Uh, yeah. What about uh, policy? So, for example, the research that you've seen, um, I think we can, I at least will conclude that, you know, nature is better. Um, perhaps that uh, we should take children out into nature more, especially at the in, in daycares, maybe make that uh, kind of like a municipal policies where they get X amount of hours outside. What do you think of, you know, science becoming policy? How long does that usually take? Ooh, um, I think this is actually, this is where science would really, really benefit from having kind of in-betweens between, I'm sure there are people that do this, but like, hi, my specific job is to know science and then also to be able to communicate it to policymakers in a way that everyone gets what's going on is on the same page. Because one of the things about scientists is we're, we're so excited about our work and we train four years to get all of the technical language to talk to our colleagues. And then a lot of scientists I know have an incredibly hard time just saying in general kind of what they do. And so this is also something we can, we can also learn because we already know there's tons of misinformation out there. And you know if you are an expert in something and you can talk about it in a non-technical way, it's always beneficial. So uh, it's funny because I actually had a bit of a change of heart when it comes to SciComm. I used to be like, yay, scientists are getting into SciComm. And then I realized that scientists are being pressured to do SciComm. And so I'm, I'm actually of, of the agreement to a, to a certain extent that the, the middle person is kind of a, an interesting role. I'm, I'm actually very much in favor of that because it lets, it lets the scientists do the research and not have to join Facebook because their university wants them to be on Facebook. Um, I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts on science communication as a scientist? Uh, that's interesting. I haven't, I haven't really put very much thought about it or thought into it until last year because I, I actually met with a colleague who just gushed to me about how amazing Twitter was. And I was thinking, you know, like everyone, oh, yes, another social media. Pfft, no, thank you. And he just he he was so excited about it. And he's really not a social media person. So I said, OK, fine, whatever. I'll join Twitter and I'll see what it's like. But also for science communication and connecting to your peers, Twitter is awesome. I cannot say enough how important. And to all my students, I'm like, please get a Twitter account. I get all of my papers that I read from there. I made connections with researchers. We just made a 3,000 person human co cohort in the UK because of my connections through Twitter. Like, wow. come on, it's really awesome. <laughs> I've been telling everybody that same thing. I I have one foot in the arts and one foot in science, and I haven't been able to find one social network that actually is like the location where all the artists are. But when it comes to science, oh boy, Twitter is the thing. It is absolutely amazing, and not just for connecting with scientists, but also for people like myself who who need help getting things identified, like to taxonomy help. Uh, I mean, come on, you just post a picture of a creature or an organism on Twitter and that's it. You've got your answer within the, <laughs> the day. That's amazing. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, so where is your research going next? What's the next thing that you really are super eager to study? Okay, so um, like I said, we're trying to go, I guess, if you think about how the progression was, we're trying to go chronologically. So We've actually, we've developed a whole bunch of different mouse models and all to do with pregnancy, all to do with asthma development, some risk, some protection. And so, yes, we're, we're looking in all those models in the mothers to see what happens. We're looking at the placenta, the fetus, the neonate, et cetera. And um, I think it's going to occupy us probably for the next five or six years, just figuring out what's happening in all of these models, because it's it's an insane amount of stuff that we're measuring. Um, but what we're actually kind of expanding into, again, same thing. I'm staying like on this theme forever. What happens during pregnancy and how does this influence our immune system development? Um, I want to get into metabolism. So there's a lot of things. So, for instance, um, obesity, um, if you have obesity or diabetes or something, this can also influence how the fetus develops and how the immune system develops and susceptibility for disease, et cetera. And um, so we are actually thinking about how can we expand into, so we have some pregnant animals and 
you know, if you have an obese pregnant uh, mother um, and then what happens to their baby's uh, immune system development or stuff like that. And that's also t closely tied to the microbiome and everything like that. So that's where we are headed anyways. That is so cool. I actually interviewed an Austrian uh, fat cells researcher um, cool. who who just t taught me so much about you know metabolism, brown fat cells, which are like the harmful ones, I guess, is what they're called in, in, in layman terms. But just uh, really, really cool. That sounds really interesting. <laughs> yeah, and again, it's, and it's going to be exactly like the microbiome. I'm going to go, yeah, I want to yeah. get into metabolism. I'm going to, I know nothing about metabolism. Oh, no. And then, <laughs> yeah, starts all again. So <laughs> that's why that's I have PhD the fun students. Part. Is yeah, PhD the, students the, for yeah. sure. This is the beautiful thing about PhD students. I'm not allowed in the lab anymore, finally, which is beautiful. But actually, when they come talk to me, they know so much more than me. And it's so amazing. I love it. Like, that's that's your job as a PhD student to know way more than your supervisor and then help them to understand. You're like a maestro. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Right? Really. I mean, you, you have this orchestra right? and then people who can play the violin better than you. And, and you know, everybody... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so what do you do outside of science? Like, what's your jam? What's my jam? Huh? Okay. I am an acrobat. So I trained in acrobatics for 10 years. Um, meaning, I guess not uh, so partner acrobatics. So basically, all ways you could climb or do handstands on another person <laughs> that are possible. <laughs> And and did you do this uh, competitively? Did you do it for fun? Did, were you in theater shows? Were you in the circus at any point? It's just it, just a hobby. It actually we started when I was in Canada, and I have a friend who's a, a gymnast, and he's like coaches at a gymnastics hall. And we thought, oh wow, there's this neat thing called acrobatics, and so we downloaded a whole bunch of pictures from the internet, and then we just. Do you think we can do this? We have no idea. It's set up crash mats everywhere and maimed ourselves. <laughs> we learned hilarious. a lot of things. And then when I came to Germany, there's actually tons of really amazing acrobatics groups all over Germany. And so, yeah. So then I found lots of training partners. And, you know, when you train with people who know what they're doing, you learn a lot faster. Absolutely. And Berlin is a place for the arts. It's a home of the arts in Europe, really. Oh, I love this city, man. This is why I'm not going back to Canada. Sorry, Canada. I love you, but Berlin is too rad. I can't go. It's can we, awesome. So can we talk about that? Because I so I lived in Montreal for three years because Montreal is like Canada's Berlin. It's as close, I guess, as we would get to to that in in Canada, except it's gotten so much more expensive. And now it's definitely not Canada's Berlin. Um, but so let's talk about the, the, you know, we have about 10 minutes left, the cultural differences between Canada and Germany, um, and as well as Berlin and any other city in the world, I guess. Um, yeah, I think when whenever you move to a different country, there's always, <clears throat> there's always, you know, things I say, for instance, man, Canada, can't you do things like Germany? And then when I'm in Canada, I'm like, Germany, can't you look at Canada and see all these good things they're doing? So, you know, there's always this kind of toss up. There are definitely like strong differences in the way people kind of conduct themselves. And yeah, and it's, I, but what I find is the little tiny things. Like, for instance, when I go into a doctor's waiting room in Canada to see the doctor, they say, oh, yes, Melanie Conrad. And then I come in and everything, you know. And when you go to the doctor's office here, they're extremely, extremely strict about title. So if I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the doctor's office and they say, Frau Dr. Melanie Conrad, and I'm like, you don't need to announce my don't, don't, but they always do it. It's an absolute matter of matter of protocol. So it's all these little tiny things that build up in in diff between different countries that you realize kind of what makes you think about how different they are. I, I interviewed a um, um, a Canadian who studied, who did, I think it was her master's or her PhD, now I forget, in Germany, who's Canadian. And she said the differences for her were that the universities in Germany didn't have sports teams. Oh, yeah. I never even thought about that. And also, um, not there's no convocation ceremony. Like when I finished my PhD, oh. um, my parents came and I... Put on my my robes and all the professors put on their extremely dorky looking robes from their universities, which makes me laugh a lot. 
and then yeah my mom sat through a three-hour ceremony of 200 and however, however many people's names being called to get their diploma and that that doesn't exist here as far as i know like i said that to my uh, one of my friends and they went what <laughs> like, i got mine in the mail like <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, are scientists valued in Germany? Is that like a very prestigious title or prestigious occupation? I think because I, from what I've observed being in Germany, there tends to be a very big emphasis on title, like what I just mentioned, you know, calling my title and I'm in the doctor's office. And, you know, so I think the medical profession and the research profession are really highly valued. And um, yeah, but on the other hand, I also want to emphasize that it's really great to be, you know, have a PhD and stuff, but you, I know tons of people who don't have any formal in- education who are absolutely brilliant and they just read a lot. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I try not to do this kind of hierarchical thing because everyone has their own, what they're really, really good at that I'm not good at. So. Yeah. I mean, with, with people who are autodidact, right. I mean, I'm, I'm a university dropout. I dropped out seven times. There was no way I was going to go back. It's not for me. Uh, but I mean, I think, um, I think there's more acceptance of that these days to Mm -hmm. university dropouts are not necessarily, you know, losers anymore, uh, especially because technology. So I work in tech, I'm a tech consultant. So the technology world has proven that you don't need a university degree to be a tech engineer anymore. You know, it's a very interesting. Yeah, and I can guess as well that like if you're hiring a person for so tech engineering, yeah, they're probably they're going to come and you're going to teach them how to do the job right there, right? Rather than oh yes, I've got blah 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 degree, and you're like, well, that doesn't matter because I have to teach you how to do the job anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. so would you say then that you're pretty much married to Berlin at this point in your life? Is this the uh, the place where you want to grow old? Okay, I stopped saying forever. I used to always be kind of hyperbolic. I'm like, this is the best thing and it's going to be forever and never change. And then I realized, oh, right, things kind of work in 10-year cycles. But um, interestingly, I've been here over 10 years, the longest I lived in any city kind of outside my hometown. And I, I still, the fact that I still just love it. Uh, yeah. And I can't think of any other city that I've been to that is cooler than here. So... <laughs> that's beautiful. And it sounds like you have a great research team as well. So that's yes. a, a massive bonus. Uh, so, well, we're pretty much out of time at this point. Um, Dr. Melanie Conrad, thanks again for coming on the show. I learned a ton and I definitely want to keep an eye on your research for the next few years. I think what you're going to uncover is potentially going to be very, very amazing. So good luck with that research and uh, I'll stay on top of it on Twitter for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much for the invitation. That was really fun. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.